Hey, what's up, Masters? Welcome to another episode of Path to Mastery Podcast. And today we are with Mr. Oscar Trimboli. I hope I said your last name right. How, how was that? Perfect. Close? Oh, perfect. Cool. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Okay, good. I love that. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. And as I was saying earlier, before we started recording, um, you wrote an awesome book. I'm holding it up right here. For people that are watching it on video, how to listen. It's just a quality, even it, the way it feels. I mean, this is a nice book, man. And uh, and I, I just love it. I got a bunch of notes. I got some highlights in here. And and uh, it's all about listening. Right? Why, tell, well, first yeah, of all, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you an intro in a minute. But what caused you to write a book on listening? Well, this is book number three. So this is the third book on listening. And... Uh, uh, no stroke of genius or anything like that. Ironically, listening to my clients asking me to write a book, uh, they all said, look, Oscar, it's great. You turn up, you do the workshops, you deliver keynote speeches, really impactful in the way you help our leaders. But when you walk away, can you support us? And I thought, hmm, that's a good question. And I thought, I have no idea how I can support them. So I simply said, what would that look like? And they said, well, now, can you give us an assessment, a way to ask ourselves some questions and maybe some follow-up and a, and a book? Um, hey, Oscar, your newsletter is interesting, but for listening, what about a podcast? So all these things came about because I listened to my clients. Honestly, sometimes I heard them, but I didn't listen to them effectively. So the book number three, How to Listen, has come about by listening to the people we know, but deliberately listening to the people we don't know as well. And we did research with over two and a half thousand people to understand what gets in people's way when it comes to listening, what are the things they'd like to improve in their listening. And nearly 26,000 people now have taken the listening quiz to discover what gets in their own way when it comes to listening, David. So that's, that's what prompted the book and what prompted the passion in listening. That was a completely different story. <laughs> Excellent, man. Well, let me, let me tell our listeners who you are and uh, listeners, uh, <laughs> no, no pun intended there, but we'll tell, tell the listeners who you are and you'll know, see is, uh, is an author, uh, host of the Apple award-winning podcast, deep listening and sought after keynote um, along with a deep, listening uh, ambassador communities on a quest to create a million deep listeners in the workplace um, through his work with chairs, board of directors and executive teams. Oscar has experienced firsthand the transformational impact leaders can have when they listen beyond words. I think that's what we were. That's what I was trying to allude to earlier before we started recording. He believes that when uh, leadership teams focus their attention on listening, they will build organizations that create powerful legacies for people they serve uh, today and more importantly for the future uh, generation. And Oscar is a marketing and technology industry veteran work, working for Microsoft, PeopleSoft, uh, Polycom, uh, uh, Vitafoam, I'm probably saying that wrong, consults with organizations including American Express, AstraZeneca, Cisco, Google, um, you know, just some couple you know, small name companies like uh, HSBC, Salesforce, uh, SAP, Science, Siemens, you know, just little, little, little tiny companies. Um, author of How to Listen, as well as two other books, as he mentioned. And uh, he said, discover the hidden key to better communication. So thanks for joining us, man. I'm really grateful you're trusting me with your tribe, David. And uh, thanks for creating the legacy of your work as well. Amen. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I almost left out probably the most important part is uh, Oscar loves his afternoon walks with his wife, Jenny, and their dog, uh, Kilimanjaro. On weekends, uh, you will find him playing Legos with one of his four grandchildren. So amen to that, brother. Thank you. So so talk to us about how to listen. Okay. If I come up to you and I say, hey, I need the biggest tip on how to become a better listener. I've got notes here. And I'm going to start right there today. 
Like what's, what's your, what's your thing? Like what, what, what's the thing that you tell people if someone's like, I just want to know how to be a better listener, Al Oscar, what would you say to him? Uh, good, good listeners notice what people say and great listeners notice what people don't say. When you know the science of listening rather than just the art of listening, the science is really simple. The speaker is speaking at 125 to 150 words per minute. And if you're auctioning property, you're speaking at about 200 words per minute. You can still understand people. Yet people are thinking at 900 words per minute. That means the first thing they say is 14% of what they think and what they mean. And if you want to have more powerful business relationships, if you want to have shorter meetings, if you want to have more profitable work, if you want to create a sales organization that's completely invisible, that's your customers, they'll refer you because they'll say, yeah, David's awesome at what he does, but what sets him apart from everyone else? He really gets me, he really listens. And that is a big differentiator in our modern economy as well. So my big tip is it's great to hear what people say. It's even more important to notice what they don't say. Mm. Yeah, I actually have that. It's uh, it's not what's said in the conversation. Talk talk to us about that. The things that are not being said. How does how does somebody pick up on that? Well, a lot of time people aren't comfortable with this. So there's no coincidence that the word silent and listen share exactly the same letters. So the first thing I would invite you to do is just become a little bit more comfortable with silence because silence acts like a magnet for the speaker. It draws out of them what they think and what they mean. Now, extended periods of silence might be perceived as awkward or intimidating. You need to know the relationship you're in to use silence there. And two other words, phrases I would give you is Think about these two phrases to draw out what people haven't said. Most of us don't realize we have a listening compass in our back pocket, but we're not even conscious whether we're going north or south or east or west. So I'm going to give you some north-south questions. These are questions that keep the conversation going with the same energy in the same direction. You're listening for what's similar and what's familiar. And I'm going to give you some east-west questions questions that will turn the speaker 180 degrees and get them thinking in the distant future, the distant past, get them to think about what they're talking about in a very, very different way. The shorter your questions, the more likely it is you're going to draw out what they haven't said. So the first question is really simple and make it your own. Don't use it robotically like this. I just want to give you the phrase and then I'll make it my own. So the phrase is, tell me more. Now, I can guarantee you, David, I've never said that. <laughs> I would always say, fascinating. Could you say more about that? Wow, I'm really curious. Could you expand on that just a little more? Ah, oh, interesting. Say more. And in that moment, they'll be able to catch up with what they haven't said. They will then use phrases like, hmm, actually, David, what I haven't said is, typically, there's a sigh. Typically, their head changes position on their spine. Typically, their posture will alter ever so slightly. By the way, if your head's in a phone, a laptop, looking at a connected watch, you'll miss all these cues. So be careful to bring your presence to the conversation. When they use these phrases like, hmm, actually, or you know what's important, or actually what I haven't said is, oh, now that I think about it a little longer, so these are questions that help people go in the same direction and the same energy. Sometimes that's useful. Typically at the beginning of a conversation, beginning of a relationship, beginning of a meeting, you want the conversation to go in the familiar, in the similar, in the same direction. Partway through the conversation, partway through a project, partway through a relationship, you may want to mix it up because the, the story may be getting repetitive um, they may be stuck and you can simply ask them, hmm, and what else? Now, although it sounds linguistically very similar to tell me more and what else will move them in a different direction. Now, rather than saying, and what else, 
make it your own. Here's how I say it. Wow. Is there anything else you've considered? If we're going to go forward five years, is there anything else we need to think about? If we went back a decade, is there anything that would tell us to go in a different direction? All these questions get them to pause in their thinking and then say what they think and what they mean. Now, listening at work is not therapy, David, so be careful. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not looking to solve any problems in, in a therapeutic way. We're looking to have meetings that are shorter, better commercial outcomes, and more effective for both the speaker and the listener. I'm curious what's going through your mind while I'm saying all this, though. Are you turning around on me? <laughs> um yeah so what yeah what's going through my mind is um is uh when you talked about the meetings being shorter i guess that's one thing that the so uh, you would think that um the shorter would be a more effective meeting correct mm. is that that's absolutely that would, the intention, yeah, but yeah, yeah. That would probably contradict what most people think right yeah because they kind of think about listening like watching a netflix video with some therapist on a couch asking lots of extended questions or at the movies or on a tv that's their perception of what listening is good listeners hear what people say great listeners change the way the speaker communicates and they move the speaker from what they've said to what matters to them when they say what matters to them, you don't waste an enormous amount of time in the conversation because you're in the essence. Yet most conversation, because we're just talking about the very first thing that somebody says, it's just like a deck of cards that are sh unshuffled and it's like ace of spades, king, queen, jack. It's like, where's the order in this? When you take the time to help them with those simple questions, their thinking starts to narrow down and get to the essence of what matters. A lot of people realize that, oh, you know, I've got all these meetings and I've got back-to-back -back meetings and it's an interesting way to run your life, but time is a figment of our imagination. Uh, David, an interesting uh, bit of trivia about time clocks were not synchronized till the 1800s because the railways in England wanted to make sure that a train that went from one end of the country to the other had the same time schedule. A lot of us, our time is defined by the software we use to send a meeting out. Uh, who made the rule that we need to start a meeting at the top of the hour? Uh, software companies. That's basically who. So one tip we give everybody to shorten meetings, if you think about a one-hour meeting or a 30-minute meeting, don't start at the top of the hour and make a one-hour meeting a 50-minute meeting. Make a half-an-hour meeting, a 25-minute meeting. And when you start off the top of the hour, this is what happens. People come in and go, oh, Thanks for starting five after the hour. I've had time to visit the restroom. I've had time to grab a glass of water or a beverage or something. And I've had time to collect my thoughts. At five after the hour, they arrive at the conversation ready as opposed to, and I don't know, David, tell me if you've been in these kinds of meetings. You have a meeting at the top of the hour. Someone arrives, if you're face-to-face -face or virtually, oh, look, I'm really sorry, I'm running late. I just finished a meeting and I'm just coming back out of that meeting. They arrive somewhere between two, three, four after the hour. They're physically present, but they don't get into the meeting mentally till about seven, eight, nine minutes after the hour because they're still processing the last meeting. So when we say, if you listen well, you can shorten the meetings, the first thing you need to do is just create this illusion of time where you start at five after the hour. Ironically, your attendees are arriving at the identical time it's just one's arriving in a distracted state of mind and another one is arriving ready for a conversation. So, so here's a question for you then, because as you're, as I'm listening, we, uh, we hope we run a, I run a, a huddle every morning and this is one of the 
the the challenges is you know we've got about 30 30 35 people and it starts at nine but people are popping in at 903 907 910 915 right and it's like you know i, I always want to start off with wins but then you know someone will pop in at eight past and then hey i want to share a win too well why weren't you here at nine so what I, I it's like what do you if i just because i was actually thinking ironically you're saying this but i was thinking about this this morning is maybe it just bring them oh start the meeting at nine but play a video or something till like nine ten i mean what are your thoughts on that? i'd love to get your 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 feed your opinion on like what would be a, a smart way or just start the meeting at not my thought is scare fear is i start at 9 10 and everybody shows up at 9 15 9 18 9 20. What, what are your thoughts man all right next time you have this meeting blow up the agenda david and say simply this i want to understand we've been doing these meetings for how long by the way how long have you been some doing of, these? Some meetings? of these people have been in there for 18 months. I mean, it's, it's right. Yeah. Uh, okay. We've, we've yeah. been doing these meetings for 18 months. Today, I want to listen to you. I want to understand what's productive in this meeting. I want to understand what you want to change in this meeting so we make it shorter, more effective, and everybody arrives on time. Uh, is it video or is it face to face? Yeah. Yeah. So they're on Zoom. Nope. They're on Zoom. We do it. Oh, it's awesome. a huddle. It's a morning huddle every, every morning, Monday through Friday. Oh. Either I run it or we've awesome. got a few other people that run them. Okay. So for the first five minutes, what I'd like you to do, just be by yourself. Have a think about what's the thing we can improve in this meeting and pop that in the chat. And then we're going to talk about it. Now, one and mm. be deliberate. One of the things I'm struggling with is not everybody's arriving on time, which I think everybody misses out on. And I want to understand what's getting in people's way and how we can support that. If that's an issue for you, please pop that in the chat. It's, you, you don't need to solve it, David. They can solve it for you. Just pass it back to them. The collective genius of your 20 folks in the huddle <laughs> is going to be more potent than any idea you and I are going to come about. Like, I'm, a, I'm good at what I do, but I don't pretend I'm better than 20 people. That would be arrogance. Ask the group. They know better than anybody else. I did this with a, a software company. They have a lot of software engineers and similar setup. They they have huddles and sprints and they talk in this language of agile and, and, and what they're trying to do is improve on a daily basis, which no doubt you're trying to do as well. And I asked the group this very question. I, I said, you know, thinking about the huddle you get into every morning, what's broken? What's working well? And it's important to talk about what's broken first so we can exit on a high around what, what we're doing well. Most people do it the other way, and all you end up doing is talking about problems at the end of the meeting, and the energy is just like this when everybody leaves. We don't want it to be there. We want the energy to be great as we go out. So it's probably not the answer you've expected, but I'm curious how you think the group would respond to such an approach, David. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think some, I, 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 I wrote down. I think what I need to do is um, probably send a video because there's, you know, I'm going to be preaching in a choir, in, in, in right, in, in, a, in a lot of ways because there are people that are there at, at eight fifty nine, you know, a handful, hmm. um, and then. So I, I I was thinking like what are your thoughts I, I'm thinking of maybe even right after this call, just creating a a short video, a couple minutes, and just like you said, asking like hey what what do you, what do you want us to do to 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 make these meetings like I want to I want to get your feedback what can what can we do to make mm -hmm. these meetings better so that you would you would want to show up at eight fifty nine right Yeah I so mean, what, what, what do we want to do. What we want to do is notice that your instant anticipation is to go, I want to send out a video. Now, that makes it really time efficient for you, doesn't it? That's why you want to do it. It's like, do it once, send it out, yeah. here we go. So it's efficient for you, but is it effective? If you think about all that team on a continuum, at one end, let's use time as a 
as a way to differentiate the group. There's the 859ers, let's call them that. But the other group is the 909ers, the 859ers and the 909ers. And there's a range there. My speculation is some of these folks needs to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Some of these folks are happy with that video. And you need to mix your communication approach based on what works well for them. Now, my suspicion is when I said some of them prefer one-on-one, -on -one, you instantly thought of a handful of people who don't respond to the video well. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So as leaders, one of the things we need to be conscious of, if we want to be heard, if we want our message to be listened to, and the difference between hearing and listening is action. So if you want people to take action, you're going to have to communicate in multiple modalities, in multiple ways, in multiple forums. It's not enough to say the message once. The other opportunity you have to, David, is buddy up the 859ers with one of the 909ers and get them to have a chat. So why do you turn up on time? I got all these, I'm finishing client calls. Why, how can you be there on time? You know, it's stimulate a conversation with the people who are performing in an, and in a way that's expected with those who are struggling. So for me, it's be conscious of how you communicate because we always tend to communicate from our default preference rather than the way that's effective for the person who we want to communicate to. So how do you catch that? And by the way, the reason I'm coming back to you with these questions consistently is my job is to make sure I understood what you heard and understand whether it was useful. And I'm adjusting my approach as I go along in the way I'm communicating here today, David. Good stuff, man. Um, I love it. Let me ask you this then. Um, I'm looking at my notes. And one of the things you asked me before we started recording, what was my takeaway? Uh, one of my takeaways, mm. and, and I'd say my takeaway was um, one of them I started to share was, uh, was I, this was from, was listening, but with no intention, right? Just right. Like, is that what you talk about in the book? It's like, there's a, there's a, a yeah, we talk, of... a, we talk about listening is the willingness to have your mind change. When you bring your presence to the conversation, the speaker doesn't yes. feel rushed and they say what matters to them. And if you bring your presence and we talk about giving attention and paying attention in the book, and we talk about the difference between the two types of attention you can bring to a conversation. If you honestly, if you brought either of those attentions to any conversation, again, your presence will be like a magnet to the speaker and they go, wow, they're drawing out of me what matters. Because when they have space to say what they think and what they mean, they feel heard, seen and valued. And when they feel heard, seen and valued, they'll give you extra effort. They'll adjust the way that you communicate. So your presence both physically and mentally, and the way you bring attention to the conversation will alter the way a speaker communicates with you. And as a consequence, your meetings are shorter and your commercial outcomes are more effective. Mm. And how does somebody get better at, at that? Like practice, just listening from a place of being present. Like a lot of times, I'm and I'm just being honest, I, I, I feel like I can definitely... Like I've got an agenda a lot, of, a lot of times and I'm listening to figure out how I can help this person as opposed, does that make sense? Like as opposed to. Uh, yeah. No, so it's, remember it's we talked about. True. You, you do. Let's be honest. You have an agenda. So we, I want to show you how to use that listening compass at the beginning of a conversation. So, you know, their agenda, you know, your agenda and you know what the shared outcome is. When you ask this question, uh, a wonderful recruiter in the UK, Emma, who's been working with us, says it's completely transformed the way her clients communicate with her. And it's completely changed the way her team communicates with her. And she knows that this question's sticking because her staff are using the question back on her now. 
if you use this question either before the meeting, maybe you've got a meeting schedule for the next day, send the question to the person you're talking to in advance. That will give their subconscious more time to process it. But if you don't have a chance and it's the first meeting, at the beginning of the meeting, just ask this very simple question. And when you ask this question, we're going to use it to calibrate all the way through the conversation. It's like a dashboard on a car. It's going to tell you where the fuel gauge is on their speaking and your listening and how effective the communication is all the way throughout. If you're visualizing that 50 minute meeting, we want to ask the question at the beginning. And then we're going to ask checking questions every 15 minutes against that question. And this will help you when you've got your own agenda to recalibrate yourself and go, oh, hang on, I just need to check the way I'm listening. So here's the question. It's really simple, but it's also simple to get wrong. What would make this a great conversation? Now, what most people say is, what would make this a great conversation for you? That's not the question we're asking. There's always a third element in every conversation, the speaker, the listener, and then this invisible force called the dialogue. This has got pace. This has got energy. This has got direction. It's what we all remember. This question is used to guide the dialogue. Now, our research tells us if you ask somebody, David, what will make this a good conversation? David will answer the question. What we also know is only 28% of David's, the person you ask, will ask the opposite question. And the opposite question is, what will make this a good conversation? If they don't ask you, simply say, thank you. And from my perspective, a good conversation would be this and that. Just add what you need on. This is not the agenda. This is not the line items you're going through. It's how we're having the conversation. At the 15 minute mark, you say, hey, David, I just want to check in at the beginning of the meeting. You said this will make it a good conversation. How are we going against this? Roughly in a third of cases, our research says, thanks, David, got everything we need. Let's wrap it up. Anything else you want to cover off? In a third of situations, the person will say, thanks for checking in. Yeah, we need to spend a bit more time on this. And in another third of situations, they say, look, I've got everything I need on that. But what we've been talking, there's something way over here that's actually popped up that I haven't told you. Can we discuss that with the balance of our time? Now, checking in with that question will keep your listening on track, David, rather than you being completely obsessed about what you want and your agenda. This will help you calibrate and stay on track. It's the steering wheel in the conversation. That's a, that's a, uh, I wrote that down. <laughs> that's cool. That's a cool question. And I think it fits for, uh, for anywhere. I mean, I, I, we, you know, we had a, a similar, I, I guess more, you know, say I work with salespeople and, and uh, you, we'd meet with sellers and we'd ask at the beginning of a, a, you know, when I was selling real estate, I'd ask at the beginning of the meeting, okay, what, what's the most important thing you want to get from this meeting today? And, uh, but then it's a you, uh, and they'd usually tell me, and, and I think that's a, that's probably a fair question. I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, probably not exactly what you're saying, but, um, what, what are your thoughts on that, that question? Yeah. When you're the process expert, okay. As a real estate leader, you're sold more properties than they have. Right. So yes, yeah. they, in a lifetime, I don't know, would you sell two or three houses as an owner unless you're an investor? Probably. So you don't actually you don't actually know all the steps. So I would come back to them and go, thanks. And some other questions that people at your stage of the process typically want to cover off is do 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 do. So it's not David saying it. It's like, based on my experience, this is what other people like you are asking at this stage. Mm. And the important question is, is that important to you? So it doesn't matter what you say, is that important to you? Because if it is, they'll nod and go, great. You've been useful even before the conversation started. And if they go, no, no, I got that all covered off. Okay, 
no problem. But all of a sudden they've gone, well, he cares enough to bring his experience from other clients into this conversation. I want to just share a really simple story related yeah. to real estate. Uh, do you, uh, let me just uh, real next, quick, and then I'm going to have you share the yeah, story. Yeah, do you use ahead. the word why? Because I noticed a few times you, will you use the word why? And and if if not, well, how come? Why not? <laughs> like what? Because I know, I've know i noticed, uh, like some people are, are against using that word, right? Um, like, why is effective in the right time, in the right place, at the right part of a project or relationship. But when you use why too early in a relationship, in a conversation, people will become defensive. Whether you talk to hostage negotiators or suicide counselors, they will consistently say, don't use why, use it sparingly. So when it comes to our listening, choose when to use why. My guidance would be simply this. Do you know them well? Okay. Uh, an effective why is important. If there's something significant at risk and it's early in the relationship, the use of why will create defensiveness on the part of the other person. Help me understand. How would you approach this? These are asking the identical intention. But the first time we ever got asked why, we were five or six and we spilt the milk. We broke a plate. We did something and our parents scolded us. That is the first time we heard why. And emotionally, we are coded to become defensive as soon as we hear the word why. So why by itself is not good or bad. A skillful use of why at an appropriate point in time is really potent. I think a lot of us don't use why consciously. When you do, it'll be really powerful. All right. And you were going to share a story and then I, I jumped in with the why question. No, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like an ex-boss of mine was uh, doing a renovation on his home and many, many builders came through and eventually he, he went with one contractor who, who built the home. And one of the things the builder did was, was listen to what the home meant from a construction point of view, of course. What's the specification? What's the build? What's the quality? What's the budget? And on the day before the construction was complete and they were handing over keys, the construction team built a wood-fired pizza oven. And they invited all of the contractors there and my boss's family. And they said, look, we heard you'd love to entertain. We also heard that barbecues aren't always suitable for everybody. So we built you a wood-fired pizza oven. Now, my boss, tell ex-boss, tells that story every time people go to his house. He names the builder because the builder realized what the home meant, not the construction cost and the quality. And when you listen to what people mean, you'll create an invisible sales force. And he still tells that story today, a decade after, even though the wood-fired pizza oven is charred, it's smoky, it's got all kinds of stains on it, but it's full of stories and meaning. Are you listening for what it means for the person you're working with or are you just listening to what they say? When you do the meaning, they'll become your advocates. Amen. Well, I'm going to see if we have any questions here. Uh, does anybody, uh, if here's your chance, if you're interested in asking Oscar a question, just raise your hand. I will invite you up. So we'll see if we have any questions from Clubhouse. Uh, well, we it looks like we uh, we do not. So awesome. So for, well, first off, how do uh, people, Oscar, um, what's the best way for somebody to get in touch with you? I think you also mentioned an assessment earlier today. Yeah, look, I, as much as I'd love you to get in touch with me, I'd rather you got in touch with your own listening. <laughs> you can take a seven-minute quiz at listeningquiz.com. You can answer 20 questions. You'll get a report that's five pages. It will tell you your primary and secondary listening barrier, and it will give you three tailored tips about what to practice every time you do that as well. If you love to read, 
you can grab the book how to listen and if you're commuting regularly if you're in real estate and traveling from location to location i have to say hope my publisher's not listening the audio book is the best version of the book because we have extended interviews with the people from the book in the audio book as well amazing um great you tell me anything i uh what's a what's a question that you typically get asked that uh maybe i didn't ask or did i miss anything like what what else should we have talked about um i'll put it back to you uh as interesting as a question as that is again the orientations on us here's the question we should have asked what's the question the people who are listening the tribe you know and lead david what do you think the question they want to ask us is take a moment and collect your thoughts because i think that's a more useful question than anything you and i would come up with yeah it's a, it's a good question um and i'm just i got a bunch of notes here that i didn't even really go into um I, well i think what I'm trying to think of it from their perspective um the people that listen to this are mostly uh sales people real estate agents um, I think they would probably ask, how is this going to help me close more sales, this interview? When you listen to what people think and mean rather than what they say, you'll move from trying to beat your competitor to try to help them understand what the sale means to them. Because if somebody's selling a home for a divorce, the meaning behind that is completely different to somebody who's upsizing because their family is growing. Their motivations are very different. So the thing I would say to you is this. Most of what I've told you is not going to help you close a sale if all you're doing is listening to what they are saying. Take the time to listen carefully to what they haven't said. If you use silence, if you use tell me more, if you use and what else effectively, they will tell you things that they won't tell your competition and you will have more sales as a result. That makes a ton of sense, my friend. Um, I appreciate you. And there's one other tip that I, I wrote down that I started doing uh, from your book is in it's uh, giving about three minutes uh, prep time before uh, going into a conversation, which has been uh, tremendous because I, I do journal every morning mm -hmm. and um, I use a specific journal that I have to put my appointments into. And then what I'm doing now is it, it's making me actually write, like, okay, what, you know, what really intention do, do I want to come from this appointment, not just for me, but also for the other person? And, yeah. uh, and, so I think, and you've yeah. got a wonderful ritual there that bringing your presence to the conversation even before it starts. A good listener focuses on the conversation and the dialogue, and great listeners realize that listening happens before, during, and after the conversation. Uh, professional bands rock bands, orchestras, any kind of musician, even if they're playing in the same location with the same band, with the same instrument, three hours earlier, they tune their instrument before they go into the performance. Give yourself that chance. Shut down all the browser tabs in your mind. Tune your listening instrument, which is your mind. And the easiest way to do that is just to play three minutes of music that will completely rewire your listening and recharge your listening batteries as well. And if you're present enough to journal, like David, um, that is a practice I would recommend as well, because it's just stilling the mind and shutting down the browser tabs all over again. You know what, you know what it occurs to me as, I, as uh, I'm hearing you is um, not just writing it down in the morning, but then looking at it again before the conversation 
which is not mm. something I've, <laughs> to be honest. It just, I'll tell you, the writing in in the morning helps in itself, but I could imagine the next level will then be again three minutes before the conversation listening to it. and you mentioned music is like you're saying to listen to some music yeah three uh, three minutes of music will rewire your brain from whatever you were thinking about before to a completely different space pick whatever music you want i've got three songs they're at completely different tempos one's purely instrumental it's about 80 beats per minute Another one's an upbeat, happy kind of song. It's about 120 beats per minute. And then the last song is a very high tempo, um, 180 beats per minute song. Uh, it's got lyrics in it that mean something to me, but it, the lyrics are about bringing my attention to the people who are listening to me rather than it being about me. So all of those... Basically, most of us don't realize that our listening battery is pretty drained at some part of the day. Music is like that instant recharge to take you from red to green in three minutes or less. Well, I'm going to start using that tomorrow, and I appreciate uh, this amazing book you sent me, um, and I also appreciate the conversation. And Awesome. I look forward to listening to it again because I, I usually get more as I'm listening now, trying to think of my next question and I'm making notes, you just don't get it all, right? And it's just, uh, I, I've noticed that about myself, but then I'll go back and listen to it again. And uh, that's when I usually get the gist of it, the majority, you know, the real good stuff. So. Yeah, and have some compassion for yourself, my friend. Our brain is a fast moving Ferrari and uh, sometimes we've got to give it some maintenance. So that's okay too. Amen. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate you. Uh, final question is uh, for anybody that's uh, listened to this. If there was one simple thing, one thing you want them to take, I know it was similar to my first question. What do you want them to take? Like, let's say somebody just popped on a couple minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you say? To, what, what do you want them to walk away with? Remember that if you listen to just what people say the first time you're hearing 14% of what they think and what they mean, listen carefully with silence. Tell me more and what else to hear the other 86% of what they haven't said. Relationships will be stronger and you'll create an invisible sales force for you and you'll never have problems filling the top of your funnel. Excellent. So, by the way, we are, are hosting a challenge. Um, if you're a real estate agent and you want to take your sales to the next level, go to davidihill.com forward slash challenge. Uh, it starts on May 29th. So we'd love to get you into the challenge. Um, and, and also, uh, Oscar, you have a quiz people can take if they want to uh, get better at uh, listening. So give them one more time the link to get to your quiz please listeningquiz.com super easy listeningquiz.com all right sir well i appreciate you thank you for your time excellent thanks for listening